Thank you, Drew, and good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Sydney, Ohio. Glad to have you here, as well as those online. Good to have you with us this morning. You might be a little cold or snowed in where you are. But we're glad that you're able to be out today and join with us either here in uh, the church house or at home comfortable. We're jealous, but we're glad that you're with us. Amen. And um, looking forward to a great time together. I have one announcement I wanted to make, and I wanted to make it when we got online. So I will make it real quick. Grace Baptist Church here in Sydney is having their spring revival. It starts today, and uh, the service will be at 5 p.m. this evening, and then it will go through Wednesday, Monday through Wednesday at 7 o'clock in the evening. Uh, our family's planning on going today, so if you would like to join us, we'd enjoy having you. It'd be nice to have a good group from uh, First Baptist to join. The pastor is from uh, Delan, Florida, and I hope that he brought some warmth with him. Uh, his name is James Knox, in K N O X, and um, uh, we are looking forward to a good time of uh, fun and fellowship this evening. Uh, if you can join us, we would be delighted. That's at five o'clock tonight at Grace Baptist in Sydney. Here, well, we are thankful for the opportunity to be able to worship our Lord and be with Him, uh, and Him to be with us. And we realize that the only way that we have to know God is through His Word, right? And so when we open His Word, and I'm so delighted that so many people have again renewed their uh, devotion to go through the Bible through the year in their reading. And it's a delight to me. Just It's just like saying sick them to a dog. Uh, when uh, I hear that, I get so excited. Uh, but that's the only way that we can hear God. Uh, it's not these uh, little whispers that come through. You be careful of those whispers. Uh, it's, it's not through uh, some prophet today, but the way that we know about God is through His Word. And this song that we're singing this morning to begin with is asking God's Word to speak to us. Let's stand together and sing, Word of God Speak. Finding myself at a loss for words And the funny thing is, it's okay The last thing I need is to be heard But to hear what you would say Pour down like rain. Whoa. 
finding myself at a loss for words and the funny thing is it's okay Lord we find such delight in your word each time that we pick it up we're reminded of stories that we are familiar with we're given things that we thought we had never seen there before. And at the end of our reading, we see ourself. We see the history of humankind and the decisions they've made, often the consequences that follow. And as we read your word, um, when we come to the conclusion, we are, as the song we just sang, at a little loss for words. Lord, we're excited when we read, Never a man spake as this man. We're humbled when we read, I know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. All these stories of the Bible where great things were accomplished from men and women who didn't have enough sense to figure they couldn't, they just believed you and did. All of these things, Lord, your word is to us. There are a few times in my life, very few by comparison to others, that I've had to walk through the valley of the shadow of death with others. And your word has been my comfort. It has been the solace when my heart has been just absolutely stripped of those things that I love. And so it is everything to me. It is everything to us. And we're thankful, Lord, that your word is a living book. It's alive, quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. The Lord not only knows the intents of our heart, but the Lord knows when we're hurting and comes to comfort. So, Lord, this morning we honor your word. We honor the God of that word. And we thank you, Lord, for giving it to us. A hard copy we can hold in our hands. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. Many of you have uh, asked um, on different occasions about uh, Anna, my niece, whom we have been praying for for quite a long time. Uh, she's battling cancer. She's a young lady um, and um, has uh, the children, young children. And uh, this past week, she uh, had to go to the emergency room, and uh, they discovered yet another blockage from cancer, a growth that is blocking the ability for her to um, intake a fluid and or foods. And um, they <clears throat> were able to do um, a couple things for her to hydrate her because she was dehydrated terribly and in a lot of pain. Uh, they wanted to keep her to do um, a rather exploratory, maybe it will work, maybe it won't, procedure that was in operation. And uh, she opted out of that uh, to go home and be with her family. So she said, if you could give a specific prayer, is that God would remove the blockage, the growth that is causing the blockage. That's cancer. And if it is not God's will to do that, that God would use her experience and her life to be a testimony to his good grace and that her surgeon would come to know Christ as her savior. So um, I think that is a, an acknowledgement that we've had all along that apart from a divine touch from God, um, one of those that we have prayed for and loved for so long, um, uh, is going to drop her robe of flesh and be liberated wonderfully uh, for the glory of the Lord. And it, it hurts us down here, but trust me, it does not hurt them up there. <laughs> they are um, liberated from many different things. We often think of the sickness or the sorrow they're going through. Or one of the greatest liberations of any liberation is the liberation from sin. Man, I tell you, I cannot imagine what it would be like not to have to get up in the morning 
or walk through a day without saying, I did it again, I'm sorry. Uh, but to be liberated from that sin is a joy. Uh, we pray for the family. We pray for her. God is able. And uh, if he so delights, he will. Uh, many of us have prayed that same prayer for our loved one. And it has not been what we wanted, but been what God wanted. And um, Paul knows it's a struggle. But he says this, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's not concerning someone else. It's concerning you. And so keep her in your prayers if you would. Um, I do believe without divine intervention it, not, it will not be a long time. So keep her in your prayers. I know that she'd appreciate that. All right. So in the middle of all that, God's people for years have dealt with what everybody deals with. It is appointed in a man wants to die. Everybody's going to die. The wages of sin is death. Everybody's going to die. And we often think, well, how can you go on when you're in the midst of that? Well, those that are going through it would want us to go on, and God's Word wants us to go on, and God's songs are that which comforts our heart along with His words. And this is to remind us that even when it looks like we're in the midst of chaos and we're at the mercy of whatever wind blows that with God it's never like that. We have a firm foundation, a foundation of the Lord. And ultimately, where God wants to get all of us, He that began a good work in you will complete it. Okay. Where God wants to get all of us is, is not my will, remember Jesus praying this, but thy will be done. None of us wants to walk down the Via Della Rosa and up to Mount Calvary and lay ourselves down to be crucified. None of us wants ourselves or our loved ones to do that. But that, thank God Jesus did that. Or what, where would we be today without hope, without God, and no remedy? And so, from our standpoint, things don't always look positive, but from God's standpoint, they are always positive. Not my will, but thy will be done. Honestly, God does not do things arbitrarily. He does not do them to punish. Uh, God allows the things to go for the purpose that He desires. It was the blind man in John chapter 9 that said he had not sinned and his parents had not sinned, but that for this very purpose, Christ might be magnified through his life. And that is the goal of every Christian. I know that's what Anna would want. She would say, when you sing those songs today, sing them with all the gusto you have, that our foundation is firm and sure. So stand with me once again, how firm a foundation is laid in Jesus our Lord.
thank you very much. How firm a foundation. And now, the carol that Drew mentioned, Meditation on Southwell. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. All right. Well, <clears throat> if none of the young people want to go back for the children's church, will one of you come preach so I can go back? Because I saw the goodies that Marla brought with her. And I want, I, I, <laughs> I tried to get them. I said, she was, she was, getting ready to pick them up. I said, you want someone to carry those for you? So I, so I was, had a motive. I was going to go. There'd been one missing uh, for sure. But uh, we'll dismiss the kids at this time. Thank you. Oh, there's some goodies back there. Tell me how good they are, okay? Okay. <clears throat> I was watching a video this past week of a church and they were online service and the person that was supposed to sing the special that evening and they had evening church as well wasn't there and so the preacher did what every worker hates he just became spontaneous not with himself but with them and he said uh, why don't you get some of those kids together and come up here Beth you would have enjoyed that and sing and uh they, they, you know, the, the joy of live stream is the only one you can see is the preacher. You know, if they would have been this way looking at this, you'd seen eyeballs about that big around. <clears throat> but about 15 kids, and they were bus kids, I understand, came up on the platform. And the director sat down the front, and they had those flashcards. I remember singing those songs, you know, one way to get to... Uh, I can't even remember it now, but uh, Jesus is the only way. And all, they sang about five or six of those songs. And I, honestly, the church just, I mean, erupted in praise and shouts and amens. It was such a wonderful impromptu. But I, I don't know if I was the one that was leading the songs, if I'd have felt so excited about that, you know, just on the cuff, come up here and sing. But the kids seemed like they didn't have a problem at all. One of the songs, they all had movements. So that was exciting. And one of the song, songs in the middle of it, the, the kids get, got to go, 
woo, like this. And I mean, they, you could just see them at the beginning of the song. They were waiting for that to come, you know, the cue, so they could, they could do that. Um, but what a blessing to have uh, kids and workers. I know Beth, uh, who's been the responsible person for making sure that there are workers uh, through this COVID situation, see them come in, work with one or two or ten. You never know what you're going to get, and we appreciate their service this morning. Um, one more song I'd like for us to sing. Uh, you know, sometimes you can get so focused on what's happening uh, here that um, you forget where home is. And for the Christian, home is not here. Amen? Now, when home is really nice here, we kind of like for it to be here. But every once in a while, God says, oh, you're getting a little bit too heavenly minded. I need to, or as too earthly minded, I need to get you a little heavenly minded. And home doesn't get so good. And all of a sudden we say, oh, when's Jesus coming back? You know, about this morning, right? And uh, when, <laughs> when is Jesus coming back? But it, actually, we're supposed to live with the anticipation that maybe it'll be today that Jesus will come. This song reminds us the way of the cross leads home. Stand with me if you would. Let's sing this one. seated. Every time I think of that, Becky, I think of David. I bid farewell to the ways of the world to walk in it nevermore and into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a blessing. I mean, it's sorrowful, amen, but it's a blessing to know. I mean, it's not all of us <clears throat> have that joy of knowing that our loved one left this world to go to be with the Lord. Just think of how sad it would be if it was not that. So praise the Lord for that. And what a blessing to be able to sing those great songs of truth. You say, I've never heard that song sung like that before. Well, I <laughs> over the years, I've kind of changed them a bit. Is that right, Drew? <laughs> I've, changed, I've changed many of those songs, amen. And uh, hopefully not ruined it for you, but... I love to sing with passion and let people know that it's real. The way of the cross leads home. Take your Bibles this morning, if you would, with me, and uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We have an annual business meeting. 
that we've been trying to have forever. I think we have enough. As I look around, we're so excited to be able to have enough of a quorum that we can have it, that it'll be good and be able to move beyond it. And so, uh, you know, last week I tried to preach a short message so we could have it, and then we didn't have it. So now I have to try to preach two short messages, um, and I'm not sure that I have it. <laughs> but we'll do our best, amen. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> Some of you just got long faces. I'm, I'm just kidding, okay. John chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's a great verse. We're all familiar with it. Heard it a million times probably. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, for the past several weeks, we've been considering the subject of living life on an even keel. And we've established in order to do this, two things are necessary. First, we must think clearly. And that means more than just think. It means understand that there is a battle that rages, a spiritual battle, to gain control of our minds. And it is active all the time, that battle. It wants us to get to think of the opposite of what God wants us to think. It wants us to be involved in things, not necessarily that are bad, but they're just wrong at that time. It wants us to look at life from the view of a fatalistic, sadistic deceiver instead of through the eyes of the eternal king, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. So if we're going to live life on an enemy kill, first of all, we have to think clearly. The only way we can do that is to have our minds drenched in the Word of God. There's no other way. CNN is not going to help you get there. Fox will not help you get there. The latest soap opera is not going to help you get there. The only thing that's going to help you get there is God's Word. That's the reason he said, hide it. Hide it. Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. we got to think differently. Clearly. Secondly, we must live differently. That is, we must, as we've seen over the last three weeks, live with a vision or faith. We must understand the cost of commitment. This isn't something that we just say, oh, yeah, I'll give it a try. And we must live with determination. As God grants me the power, I will never stop until I reach the goal. This morning, I would like to suggest that we must also live with priorities. Priorities. When we think of priorities, and when I speak about priorities, we're considering what comes first in our life. It's the priorities for life. Robert Frost's poem, you've probably heard of it before, The Road Not Taken, describes two roads discovered during a walk in the woods. Frost knows it, that he can only explore one, and he tells himself that someday he will, he'll travel the other, but right now he's going to focus on the one. Realistically, he knows that he will never, ever return to this place in his life. And by the time we reach the end of the poem, if we read it all, we're not, we realize the poet is talking about something infinitely more important than a simple choice of paths. I'm going to pick it up right at the end of the poem. You're probably well familiar with it. This is what he wrote. I should be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. Upon examination we realize Frost is not talking about the choice of paths in a wood at all. But rather the choice of paths in a person's life. Choosing a road symbolizes any choice we must make between alternatives that often seem 
to be equally attractive but lead to entirely different destinations. Whether we live life on an even keel or not depends upon the choices that we make each time we come to the crossroads of Robert Frost's poem. And our priorities will function, what we have as priorities, will function, if you would, as signposts to help us determine which road that we will travel. In other words, how do we make the decisions in life that we make? I would say they are on at least four different signposts. First of all, a signpost, a reminder of unseen values. Unseen values. This was what will help us or hinder us in making the choice of which path. You see, priorities not only point the way, they also reveal the value that often hides beneath the surface our unseen values. They are uh, underneath the surface of our lives. From a biblical perspective, as the Israelites hesitated at a confusing crossroads, in Joshua chapter 24, and uh, this was uh, the passage that we looked at last week. I invite you to turn there with me. Joshua chapter 24. <clears throat> Joshua challenged the nation of Israel, his people, to make a choice. And then, charting a straight and narrow path to God, he said this in verse 15. And if it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose. Here's the path. Here's the fork in the road. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And he clearly defines the two paths. Whether the gods of which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. And then he said, I'm going to choose the path less traveled. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua knew that service could not be rendered ever to two masters. Because divided loyalties cannot maintain their balance for long. Look at this next picture that I gave you here. This is kind of an interesting guy. See this guy? If you've ever been in a situation like that, maybe it wasn't on a tightrope. Maybe it was just on a ledge somewhere. When I was a little kid, we had a railroad track behind our house. And that was what we'd do for fun. We'd, you know, one would get on one and one would get on the other throw our hands out like this and we'd see how long we could walk. After a while you got pretty good so you used the hand of the person that was on the other side to try to push them off like this, you know. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> you try to keep your balance. What I found out when I did that is that when I got out there and I started walking, all of a sudden you'd start leaning one way and what would happen is you would go, you couldn't get it right and you'd come off the tracks. Such is the truth about loyalty to two masters. You cannot maintain your balance for long. A shift in the center of gravity will always take place. And our loyalties will always lean towards one side or the other. This is precisely what Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount. And if you look in Matthew chapter 6 in your Bible, you'll see it. It's on the screen as well. Matthew chapter 6. And notice what Jesus said here in verse number 24. Very strong words. He said, no man can serve two masters. This is balancing on the railroad track or balancing on the tightrope. No man can serve two masters. For either he hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And then he defines you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon would be anything other than God. Anything that you desire in your life. And so here he's speaking to us about what happens is when we're forced into making decisions in our life, unseen, unseen, beneath the surface, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> unseen values begin to emerge. And they reveal themselves. Because God is supposed to be our master. Jesus exhorts us here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, to let any concern for our provision fall on his shoulders rather than let it take over the spot top on our list of priorities. 
Verse 25 says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought of for your life what you shall eat, or whether you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? So here he specifically says, what he wants us to do is, is to make Him our priority and allow Him to supply our need. In fact, in verse 32, notice down here in Matthew chapter 6 again, in verse 32, he concludes by showing us our Master's benevolence and how that should affect the way we order our priorities. Look at verse 32 and 33. Uh, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. And if you go back and you look at these things, it is clear it is about the normal necessities of life. And now notice what he concludes. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things mentioned before will be added unto you. And so again, <clears throat> when we're making choices in our life, one of the things that will surface is our unseen values because it will it will reveal itself as we make our choices what's really beneath the surface secondly uh, one of the signposts that we see is signposts are a, rel- a revelation if you would the revealing the showing of our absolute authority absolute authority Logically, God should have first place in our lives because he created us and is our absolute authority. That's the reason Jesus could kneel in the Garden of Gethsemane and say, not my will, but thine be done. Because he had given God absolute authority in his life. I know sometimes it's a little hard for us to wrap our mind around that because Jesus is God. But in that moment, in that time, he was the son of God given for the salvation of the world, and he made his choices in that position as the Son of God and submitted to the Father. And he showed his submission to absolute authority, saying, not what I want, but what you want. This is what the Apostle Paul is trying to communicate in Colossians chapter 1. Turn there if you would with me. Colossians chapter number 1. And notice in Colossians chapter 1 exactly what Paul is trying to communicate about this absolute authority. It's beginning in verse 13, Colossians chapter 1. And I put it on the screen so you can see it. Beginning in verse 13, he says, Who hath delivered us, the who is Christ, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, that's evil, and hath translated us, put us in, to the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now notice, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him, And for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is, here's the absolute authority, head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have what? First place, preeminence. Preeminence. One of the things that choices reveal in our life is where our absolute authority lies. Who is it that first and foremost, we believe, has the authority and the right to make that choice for us? That he might have the preeminence. First place. First place in everything, we might ask. And the answer comes swiftly from Scripture. Everything. This is his proper place. That's what it means to have Jesus as Lord. Remember, Peter? Uh, let down from heaven an axe was this sheet with all unclean beasts on it. And a voice from heaven said, Peter, arise and, and eat. Do you remember what Peter said? It's one of the most conf- confounding things in all the Bible. Not so, Lord. 
Now, you cannot have him Lord and say not so. You can't do that. What should he have said? I've never eaten that before, but if you said it, that's good enough for me. Now, Peter was prone to these kind of things. And he's the greatest illustration of me and you. The will is present, <laughs> but it's not always evident. Amen? Do you remember they came back and they had fished all night and caught no fishes? And a voice says, cast out for a great draught. Jesus said that. Do you remember what Peter said? See, a little change. He said, Lord, we have fished all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word. Absolute authority. We will cast the net. What happened? They had to call for another boat because it about sunk the ship. Absolute authority. It didn't make any sense. Jesus wasn't a fisherman. Peter was. We'd been on all night, done everything we know, then we're professional at, we didn't do it. It doesn't make any sense that he would say, do it again. We don't catch fish in the day, we catch them at night. Nothing about this sounds right. Who is it that makes the decision? Absolute authority. Nevertheless, at thy word, we'll let down the net. And they did. This is, this is what is so important. Choices that come to us Reveal where our loyalty to absolute authority is. Let me ask you a question this morning. Does Jesus have first place in everything in your life? Our priority choices are a revelation. They reveal, they show, they demonstrate where our absolute authority lies. Thirdly, our priority choices are a response of incredible relevance. Now the best way I know to explain this is to take you to Luke chapter 14. So do that with me if you would. Luke chapter 14. <clears throat> Luke chapter 14. Jesus is at a dinner party. Luke chapter 14. And in, beginning in verse number 15 through verse 24, Jesus tells this parable about priorities. Not what you would call a dinner conversation. We're going to pick it up in verse 16. And notice verse 16 and 17 with me first. Jesus says, Then said he unto them, A, great, a certain man made a great supper and bade many. He invited a lot of folks. And sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, those that were invited, Come, everything's ready. Boys, do we ever hear that at the house? <laughs> Mom yells up the stairs. It's ready. Or yells in my office. Supper's ready. Now we need to ask Mom. Do we always come? Seldom, amen. Whatever we're doing is so enticing. Right, John? That, uh, <laughs> that we don't come. That's what happened. They didn't come. Uh... If the host of this parable had been important enough to those invited, they would have made dinner a top priority. But because the host was not first in their life, other in interests wrestled their attention. Notice verse 18. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. I'll be right down. I'll be right there, honey. I'm on my way. We've all had this in our house. And she's out there trying to keep what she's worked so hard at warm. And we have other priorities. Now you ask the boys if their priority was more important than eating. It is until their stomach becomes to growl. And then all of a sudden it's dinner. But right then it was what button do I push next? And how do I escape or get into this or get out of that or whatever? And with me, it's a, man, I'm right in between Galatians 2 and 3. <laughs> Don't interrupt me right now. I'm, I'm studying. This is the priorities of our life. That our response, our response when bidden to do right is of incredible relevance. You see, look at verse 19. 
hearing, well, we'll start at verse 18 again. And they, with all consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I want to make sure they're good. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, it must have been related to Adam, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. All these made their excuses. And if you, be, if you take it and look at it, there are three things. Property, possessions, and passion. If there's anything that's going to kill us and make us take the wrong path, it's one of those three or a combination of those three. Possessions, property, and passion. These priorities came first and, and, and with the invited guests and inherently... It wasn't necessarily that any of these things were wrong, but they are designed to serve us, not to rule us. And what happened is these people that were invited to this dinner allowed those things to rule them rather than to serve them. And as a result, they kept them from the dinner. As a result of the feeble RSVP attempts by his intended guest, You know what the host did? He sent out another invitation. Starts in verse 21. This time to people who were willing to rearrange their priorities. Look at verse 21. So that servant came, showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the cities and bring in hither hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded me. Yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out of the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. So you know what happened? The host went out to find people who would set his invitation at a high priority. You know who did? The people that had needs. And they came in great multitude. Contextually and historically, This parable refers to the invitation that was refused by the Jews as a nation and was extended instead to the Gentiles. It's a picture of the invited guest who refused to come because they had other things to do as the Jewish. He came into his own, Jesus, that's the Jews, and his own received him not. They said, we're we're too busy, we got other things to do. Verse 12, where you and I got in, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So the, the parable, historically and contextually, is a picture of that. The Jews rejected Jesus. He turned and said, anybody wants to come, come. All the Gentiles piled that direction. But there is within that, this picture of The choices that we make when we're at the crossroads of decisions about priorities. The parable of the slighted host applies to us as well today. If we're too preoccupied with other priorities, then we can hardly expect to enjoy the feast of fellowship Christ has offered to those who put him first. So our priority choices are responses of incredible revelation. How we respond is extremely relevant. Last of all, our priority choices are a review of not the decision that's before us, but of our own personal decisions first and how it relates to the decision that we're confronted with. Immediately following, go back to uh, Luke chapter 14 if you would, if you haven't closed your Bible yet. Immediately following the parable, here in Luke 14, beginning in verse 25, Jesus thins the multitudes with a short course on personal priority. Now this text was last week's sermon. So we're not going to read the whole thing, but I want to get you started just so you can get this. 
you would think that after he gave the parable about the host invited people and they refused and so he turned and said anybody who wants to come can come and gave this idea of priorities that it would be impactive and that that would be enough that someone would say well man I want to make sure I make the right decision when he invites me I don't want to say no I want to say yes which in in the Christian life is the position God always wants us to be in with our ears tuned to heaven, to the voice of the Lord through His Word. And we always say yes, even when we don't understand it or even when we're filled with fear or even when it doesn't make sense. We always say yes, because what do we know about the host? That He'll never ask us to go somewhere that He doesn't go before us. But though Jesus gave this parable and he shamed the people that were invited originally and revealed the relevance of their choice that he was not the priority of their life, that wasn't enough. Jesus went even further. Because here in verse number 25, this is the one that I almost lost our secretary on, uh, verse 26, he says... If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I mean, that is tough. But he's talking about priorities. He's not saying you have to hate your relatives. He's just saying when it comes to choice between your relatives and me, you need to make the choice for me. I mean, that's That's powerful. Powerful. Now I can't speak for anybody else. I please don't take this as meddling. But when a relative comes and calls me and says, We're coming Sunday to visit some other folks in your area, we like to stop by the house, I tell them you can come anytime after noon thirty. If you want to see us before that, you have to come to church. Because I don't have any relative apart from an emergency that comes before the Lord. I don't want to. And so I would say, well, great, you can come to church. We start at 1030. And they go, uh, 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 well, we might have car trouble. I said, okay, well, um, when you get here, call me and, and uh, we can spend some time together. You buying? I mean, I said that. I bet, you know what? That only happens one time. They never ever do it again. Because they know where your loyalty lies. Now I'm not saying you have to do that. And I'm not saying that's super spiritual. I'm just saying, in my heart, I take it down to, if you hate not, you're, you can be my disciple. And I don't want anyone to ever question where my loyalty lies. First and foremost. If God told me to leave here today and go to the worst place on this earth as a missionary, I would like to think I would say yes. The worst that can happen is they kill me, absent from the body, is present with the Lord. Hallelujah. You would hear me all the way down here shouting. I'd be singing those songs. Louder than you've ever heard me sing them. If God be for us, do you know the verse? Who can be against us? <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so that's the priorities of our life. Now, I didn't mean to meddle. I just meant to give an illustration of this text. And that is, it's a review of our personal priorities. You see, we make our life choice priorities based upon personal priority choices. And Jesus thinned the group out. So again, our choices, not our speech, our choices reveal what our priorities really are. Now, in the final analysis, at every decision, give me that next one, thank you there, Andrew, two roads stretch before us. Roads that intersect, but they lead to two totally different destinations. The popular one is the way of self, leading to the dense, entangled overgrowth of ego. Man, I am ashamed, but I'm not alone. 
I have taken that many a time. The other is the way of the cross. We sang about it this morning. It's the less traveled path. Who in the world wants to die to themselves, take up their cross and follow me? Nobody. I mean, nobody wants to. I'd love to have some more pain in my life. I'll go this way. No, nobody's going to do that. Apart from a divine submission to the authority of God and the revelation of a changed heart. We sing the songs all the time. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere, anywhere. Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I will follow Him. We sing the songs all the time. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely... We sing it all the time. It's a whole lot easier to sing it than it is to live it. And here, we will make a decision in our life between the ego or the less traveled path that leads to the green pastures of intimate fellowship with Christ our Savior. My prayer today is, in all of our lives, in all of our lives, that this will be an instruction to us, a wake-up, if you would, call to make Jesus number one in our life. Now, let me put something in context for you. When I leave the house in the morning to go to Kroger's to get a pound of ground beef, I don't really have to see all these signposts. Amen? <laughs> you know, I can decide which direction I want to go, if I want to use that road or that road, and get there. I, and I'm not exercising all these wide, wide paths and which way I'm going to go, the one most traveled or the one least traveled. Most of the decisions in our life are not these kind of decisions. But there are several that are. Years ago, I remember, as I'm accustomed to, if I kneel down to pray by the bed, I wake up two hours later, I say, God, I'm so sorry. He said, no, nah, don't worry about it. You're boring me to death too. And uh, so... <laughs> Okay, um, so I stand up when I pray, and I, I just walk around. I've never seen anybody. I'm not saying that they couldn't, but I've never seen anybody fall asleep. I'm in the military. I mean, yeah, that's what I said. We'd sit there at this desk right after we'd eat, and we're watching some guy field strip a, a, a arm rifle or something like that, you know, and, and our heads are heavy. We just ate, and we like this. And, and they'd always say, if, if you get tired, stand up. Go back in the back, stand up. Nobody will give you any trouble if you stand up and go in the back of the room. If you don't and you fall asleep, you will regret it. I didn't really know what kind of consequence there would be, but I saw this guy and his head was bobbing like this, wooden desk in front of him, a head bobbing like that. Drill Stusher came back with his hands like that and wham on the back of the head and his head hit that like that. His nose splattered all over that. And they said, anybody else sleepy? And I mean, everybody was, why do you say that's cruel? Yeah, it worked. Amen. And when you're in a foxhole somewhere and your life depends on it, you better know how to stay awake. And I, I'll tell you why I didn't sleep. I didn't sleep for three months. <laughs> Man, I was scared to death. I was scared to death. I walked around a room in my house and I was at that crossroads that you see in the screen before you. And in my heart, the only thing I wanted was what God wanted. But it wasn't just me. I had a family. And I prayed out loud. And I just kept walking around that room for hours. And I pleaded my case with God. I said, you know the desire of my heart. All I want is what we've sung our whole life. All to Jesus I surrender. You have it all. I mean, everything I have is a gift from you, right? Lord, why would I be stingy with the gift? I mean, you gave it to me. And, and I, what I want more than anything else is to be in the very center of your will. Now, I know God's gracious. I have not been in the center of his will 
many times in my life. And with loving pats, he encourages me to come back to where I should be. Sometimes the pat's a little heavier than others, but gentle pat's. And I just pleaded my case. And I walked around in that room. And I want to tell you, at the end of that time, I still had no more direction than I did at the beginning. But I'd had two hours of really sweet fellowship with the Lord. And I I learned from that experience that if your heart is right, and you've looked at these signposts, and you've honestly tried to compare them with what Christ ask of you that you cannot make a bad decision because it honestly God's not interested in where you go he's interested in your heart and he wants to know that the priorities that you make for your life are centered on his will and your surrender to it and once he has your heart the other stuff is just fluff What he wants is your heart. But he can't sincerely have your heart until you totally surrender the fluff. And I walked around for a while and then finally I broke my sleep habit and I laid flat down on my belly. I was in such emotional upheaval. I wanted to make the right decision. And I did. And... um, After it was over with, I thought, I don't know why I spent so much time working on that. It was so obvious it was God's will. But I had such sweet fellowship with Him. You know, Paul wrote wrote this, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. The ultimate goal that God has for all of us is that we may know Him. And you don't learn about God by just existing. You learn about God by going through the crucible of life. And coming to the place where you have to make these decisions that so much is resting upon. And the only thing God's interested is in your heart. I hope today that God will be the center of your choice. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. For your consideration, if you have the notes, Bill McCartney shares his experience of his crossroad in his life. And how he made the wrong one. But God is so gracious. God gave him an opportunity to make the choice again. At a later time. And he did. Don't ever think because you made a wrong choice. That your life is ruined. God does not take the pottery. That is all perfect. He specializes in taking the pottery that's broken. And discarded. That's how I got in. He didn't see anything really valuable in me. He saw what could be valuable as I yielded myself to him. And he put me back on the potter's wheel. And he made me again what had been damaged before. All of us are damaged goods. But thank God the potter's fingers are able to make the most broken piece of pottery fit and meet for the master's use. He wants your heart. Father, thank you so much for this time that we've shared together in the priorities of our life. If we're going to live life on an even keel, I mean, instead of these ups and downs, they just kill a Christian. Before long, they just throw up their hands in defeat and they just quit. If, if we're going to live in an even keel, where our life seems to be somewhat the same all the time, even though there are different circumstances that will occur then it's going to be because we think clearly and we live differently, which means we're going to live with priorities. We are going to be the Joshua that says, if it seems good to you, then go ahead and do that. But as for me, this is my priority. As for me and my house, this is the way I offer my life. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord.
Help us to be those people. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me if you would. We sing this closing hymn. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. All he wants is our heart. Let's sing together. If you're a member, we would love for you to be able to stay. We need you to stay if you can. And uh, we have an annual business meeting. It won't go real long. It'll be a great time. You'll be able to see what God's done, the great things he's done in spite of all the confliction that we've gone through. And we hope that you will stay with us. If you cannot stay, may the Lord bless you and keep you and his face to shine upon you. Have a great day. Enjoy that sunshine. And we'll see you Wednesday online or in presence, 615. God bless.